with me to Revelation chapter 19. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> what we're seeing is beasts and lambs. Anybody notice that? That's what we're seeing, beasts and lambs. And um, it's an amazing thing because law and grace actually is based on the difference between his nature, which was freely given to us, and that which is trying to be right and look good and has all kind of motives for doing that, which uh, the law stirs those kind of things, and it says that in, in Romans 7. <clears throat> and so we want to look now, and we want to finish off this part about um, <clears throat> the, uh, the story of the war with just a few more uh, passages here. Revelation 19, verse 11. <clears throat> and we'll go through to verse 19. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. In verse 12, his eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. I, I remember reading that and going, well, what's the point of that? <laughs> Nobody can call you by name. Anyway, sorry. <clears throat> uh, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Hmm, this is starting to signal us who this might be. He is draped in blood. <laughs> um, and his name is called the Word of God. Oops, now we all know. <clears throat> Let it slip, John. And, uh, and the armies that were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fight, fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of and wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay, that's another clue who this is since Revelation 17, 14 said uh, that they shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. So we know that this one is representing the Lamb of God. <clears throat> because the Lamb is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All right? Uh, and I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying, You know, they really do yell a lot. <laughs> they all, it does. I mean, it's always saying with a loud voice. You know, it's not like, Hey, you know, I was thinking about it. It's like, this is Anyway, sorry. <clears throat> um, um, cried with a loud voice saying, you know, it just reminds me, Carolyn, you're going to hate heaven. You're going to hate it. You're going to hate it. Yeah. Well, what, what I was thinking is, you know, there is purgatory. Just kidding. Just kidding, people. <clears throat> with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God that you may eat the flesh of the kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and enslaved, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. <clears throat> All right, so here it is. The stage is set. This is it. This is the big one. This is the big one right here. This is the Battle of Armageddon. It's the apocalypse. <laughs> the battle. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the Battle of Armageddon. And so this thing is going to be just, you're going to see swords flying, and you're going to just see just ripping and tearing, and, or are you? 
<clears throat> All right. So <clears throat> I'm going to read from my notes here. Jesus, um, let's see. All right. So war begins, and his warriors, uh, their armor was a vesture dipped in blood, and his weapons, or his weapon is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. He uses it to smite the nations, not the devil. Well, I thought this was a big war, you know, with the devil and, you know. <clears throat> Other things are going on here. The army that is with him does nothing in the war. Because of the nation's rebellion against lamb ways, he has to rule them with a rod of iron. And he judges them as if treading the grapes of wrath because they have not. They, they are being judged because their nature as producing things opposite of the lamb. <clears throat> um, the fowls are told to gather and prepare to eat their flesh. In verse 19 begins the judgment of the beast with their armies. They come to make war. Verse 20, the battle is anticlimactic. Okay, verse 20. And the beast was taken. This is it. The big, this is the big one. And the beast was taken. And with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. All right. So, <clears throat> um, the, in verse 20, the battle is anticlimactic. All it says is the beast and false prophet are taken. I mean, I just picture, and if, I can't remember, I think it's just one angel. I think he just walks up and takes him by the arm. This do -si does him over to the, <laughs> like a fire, hey, this is it. And they're, they're not putting up a, you know what I mean? They're not a big deal going on. They're, you don't, they're not going, ah, you know, and all this, you know, movie stuff. <laughs> it's, it's like, well, we didn't know that, you know, y'all were going to do this to us. Uh, that is the extent of the war. We know that they are taken in their own devices. The scriptures say that. Their judgment is this, to be cast alive into the lake of fire. Okay. So to be cast alive into the lake of fire is not the battle. That's their judgment. That's pretty amazing too, isn't it? That that's... That that's not the battle. That's just the judgment. Here's your judgment. Clean, make a fire. <clears throat> As I wrote that, that's no battle, just the sentence for crimes. Verse 21, okay, so let's read 21. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls of the air were filled with their flesh. Okay, so in verse 21, after their leadership is taken from them, the rest that came with the beast into battle are slain with the lamb's weapon of choice, the word of God, that proceeds out of his mouth. No one among the armies of God is involved in this war. Okay, so I mean, the, the Battle of Armageddon is always put like this, this clashing of two great armies, but the army of God will win. But <laughs> you don't have that. You don't have any of that mess. You don't have that. You only have, I guess, uh, again, uh, an angel taking him by the arm and taking him over to the lake of fire. And then the word of God slays our flesh. The word of God slays all flesh. It's quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides asunder soul from the spirit and the joints and marrow. <clears throat> the 
All right. Um, let's look in chapter 20. Now, you know, you add this to the scenario of everything about the war, because remember, this is the, the story of the war. This, you know, this is the first real victory, and this victory is basically, now there's going to be some more that goes along with this, but not a whole lot more. This is sort of the wrap-up other than what he does with Satan. And really that, which is coming up in this chapter, really that has more to do with what happens after he's let loose after a thousand years. So who binds the devil and then lets him loose after a thousand years? And what does he do? He stirs up trouble and starts another war. Okay, but let's not jump ahead. This right here is the culmination of all the war, basically, in relationship to this thing because, because God has, this is, you know, the next chapter is 21, and then 22, and then that's it. So basically, God either has punished those, you know, and of course, it, then it starts talking about thrones and stuff for set. So that's when the judgment is going to come. So they've done what they're going to do. The, those that are going to repent are, have already repented now. Those that are going to conform to the image of Christ have, have begun the process and will be formed into the next two chapters of being wife of the of the lamb, the work basically is done. Now it's just the judgments. And now these judgments aren't lake of fire and this and this. That's not the first form of it. The first form of it is more like a court. <clears throat> All right, so chapter 20, verse 1 through 3. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon. See that? There it is. And I saw an angel. <laughs> Just one angel came down to the great red dragon. Puts him on a leash. <laughs> it's like, why was this so hard? <laughs> You know? you know, but remember what we read in Isaiah and in Ezekiel, when it's all done, they go, this is the one that caused nations, to, they're like shocked. This is the, this is nothing really. What were we thinking? Oh, you know, I have people come to me all the time, not so much lately, but still. Oh, the devil said to me, and I go, what are you doing listening to the devil? I don't care what he said. What do you, tell me again, who said this? <laughs> you know, the devil said, you know, and they're all freaked out. I said, um, did Jesus say the devil's a liar? Yeah. Well, is that applicable? <laughs> you know, <laughs> at any point in this conversation, the devil said, that's as far as I let him go anyway with it. I didn't, I didn't want to hear it. I already knew it was a lie. See, I don't, I don't have to go, oh, my God, what if that's true? He's a liar and the father of it, for God's sake, you know? But you'd be surprised how many people, you know, the devil said that I'm going to, you know? You're going, you know, you need to quit listening to the devil. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent who is the devil and Satan. Don't you just love it that he gets called out on all of his names? And bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. The devil said, shut him up. Amen? Let's shut him up. And shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till 
No more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Okay? The average Christian will go, no! You know, yeah, why? Why? Why would? Let's just keep him there. That's the plan. That's what, this is it. This is, this is the final plan. The devil is locked up forever. We're free from the devil. Yeah, you're free from the devil for a thousand years, but what about you? What have you conformed? Are you in the image of Christ? Have you become married? Or are you just one of the nations that's still on the earth? Not one with him. Not bride, wife of the lamb. Not that. But, you know, you could say, well, but it's for this millennium. I want to live in the millennium. <laughs> you know, why? The devil's going to be loose at the end and he's going to gather up an army that you can't hardly even number. And you go, well, where'd those people come from? The church? I don't know. <laughs> you know. But they're in the millennium, you know. And everybody, all Christians are going, I want to live in the millennium. Yeah, well, what about after the millennium? <laughs> after the first thousand years when the devil's again let loose? And we'll find out, even with Jesus there on the throne for a thousand years, as the way it's put, will he rule our hearts or will he just be the great judge over our things? Will we be changed? So I wrote... <clears throat> um, what of the dragon? One, only one of God's angels comes down with a chain and the key to the bottomless pit. See, this angel, <laughs> this angel had the key to the bottomless pit. These beasts are coming up out of that thing all along. This didn't have to happen. <laughs> this did not have to happen. And people that don't see the plan of God will go, what's wrong with God? You know, doesn't he care? Why does he allow this stuff to happen? Well, first of all, he, his care is that we become one with him, like him, after his kind. And he's not just trying to save anybody and everybody from any kind of trial or something. How many of you honestly believe in God? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you have ever gone through stuff that was hard? Raise your hand. My God, all hands. I thought God would keep us from all of this stuff. But that's not his purpose. His purpose isn't to keep us from everything. His purpose is to conform us. And when I say that, that's not an external thing. To conform us required his death. And to conform us requires bringing in to himself. And to conform us requires revealing his heart in ways that might be scary to our flesh. But we're going to have to see, we're going to have to count the cost. We're going to have to see that, not just be ignorant of that and come to something. You have to see that. That's the only way you can count the cost. You go, okay, I see that this could get bad. But I want to be with the Lord, the Lamb. Yeah.
That was the captivity that Judah went into for 70 years. <clears throat> and it was with the purpose you just said, to, to bring their hearts to him, not just their religious ways to him. Because they were already religious in their ways before the captivity. And he said, I don't want, I hate, I hate your burnt offerings and your, you don't, you have no idea of my spirit in this. So, so he does that. So, and he sends them into Babylon. Well, guess what? Babylon is one of the big points here in the book of Revelation. And he says, flee Babylon. It's the same thing. But it is, it is not just get out of here, but come back to my heart. Repent, turn, run to me. And, and it, but it's not just repent of sin. It's always, always going to be about his heart, whether it be some little thing that we're going through or some huge crisis that we go through. It'll always be about our heart. Yeah. Angel having the key to the bottle spit in that hole, like, oh my gosh, he had the whole time. I, it made me think about how I've been in situations where I just knew the problem was that other person. Right. Or the circumstance that was holding me back and that I was running up against. And really the whole time the Lord had the key to that whole right. situation. But I am carnal and I can only see the other guy. Right. You know, I can only yeah. see that person's problem. I can only see the circumstance that won't open up and give me what I think ought to be, you know, and then to realize that the Lord was behind it the whole time, right. Right. because he is looking for an image, and I'm looking for something in my carnal ways, I'm looking for something, I'm working at cross purposes, so I am blind, and I do not see that he's got the key, he can just throw the whole thing right in the pit, whatever he's done with it, right. you know, and yeah. that's part of revealing of his heart, is real, like kind of into what he's working towards, yeah. and then I won't be so blind and be beating my head against that wall. Right. Amen. Well, those circumstances that you went through, or the Babylonian captivity, or the book of Revelation, or whatever we will face in the future, they're all the same thing. I think that's right. Amen. They're all the same thing. They're all meant by God to bring about that image and that nature within us. And But to do that, I mean, why is, the, why is the book of Revelation so scary to everybody? Because they see judgment and, and death. And, and, you know, if you look, I mean, if you really look and you see how much the saints are defeated, you just go, can I skip that, Lord? You know? And so we, we invent the rapture. Or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever, whatever we can come up with that, that will keep us from becoming landlocked. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 the description of Jesus, like in the first chapter there, that he's, his hair is like wool and his eyes are like fire and his feet are like brass and, and all of the things that are, you know, I mean, I came to the Lord in the early 70s, still part of the hippie movement, and they showed, somebody drew a picture of what those words said. And Jesus looked like a freaking freak, zonked out, drugged out the, the way that he looked. And I went, far out. No, no, no I, did, I, I didn't. I was a Christian then, but I, <laughs> far out. I'm with you, Lord. Uh, <laughs> but instead, I looked at that and I went, I, I don't think he's going to look like that. Now, I didn't at that time know he was going to look like a lamb. I didn't know that, <clears throat> but the whole book of Revelation could just be pictures of what you're going through right now. It could be that. It could literally be that, and that everybody gets to experience the book of Revelation, the unveiling of Christ. See. <laughs> 
I mean, would, wouldn't that be interesting? And we all get up there and go, were you one of the ones that were there at the very end? <laughs> and they go, you know, I said, well, buddy, you're new here, ain't you? <laughs> we all been through that one. <laughs> praise God, praise God. I mean, thank the Lord for it if we understand it. If we don't understand it, 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 it would be scary. Anyway, let me finish this right here then. Um, uh, let's see, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon thrones, judgment was given unto them. And uh, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had he the mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived... And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. They lived. Glory to God. <clears throat> so I wrote, immediately following this, the one on whom the white horse is, uh, the one on the white horse is not honored. Immediately following the devil being, verse 3, being bound up and chained up into the bottomless pit. Immediately following that victory, the one, capital one, Jesus, the one on the white horse is not honored and paraded before all as a glorious conqueror. Instead, he sets about honoring all those who were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. Instead of honoring his own might, Jesus honors the true source from which the victory actually came. All the laid down lives that release the power of God in weakness. It is the slaughtered whom he chooses to reign with lamb. Can I get a wow? <laughs> this stuff's good stuff. All right, maybe I'll try to go back. Um, and just <clears throat> read, um, fill in a little bit more on what we've already talked about in last class. <clears throat> um, so you don't have to turn to the scriptures. Just let me read a little bit, and then we're, we've only got a few more minutes left anyway. In Revelation 12, 7 through 10, we see war, but it is not with the dragon and, and the, between the dragon and the lamb, but between Michael the archangel and the devil, a fallen angel. This is a war of who is the strongest among all the angels. God's angels are stronger. This is not a war meant to be the ultimate defeat of the devil but as it were, merely a battle in which the devil is removed from heaven to earth. In one sense, you could say that this battle was a victory for Satan. In one sense, you could say this battle was a victory. What do I mean by that? In verse 8 and 9, the dragon and his angels are cast from heaven to earth where God's people are located. By being cast out of heaven to earth, through it he gained greater access to, into our lives to destroy and torment us. In heaven, the dragon merely accused the saints day and night. In the earth, he seeks to kill them. <clears throat> but from God's perspective, this action of casting Satan down to the earth appears to be a victory. God sees this as a victory. The enemy is cast down. Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ through the cross, the power of the cross. It is pronounced because judgment has been meted out to the devil by casting out casting him out of heaven. What does this mean? Most might assume that judgments are poured out on bad people to punish them and remove wickedness so that God's reign might now begin. But this is wrong. Instead, it means that the seeing of the enthroned slaughtered lamb has gone before this event. They have seen the slaughtered enthroned lamb and it's gone before this and should be adequate preparation for practicing the lamb in the midst of great trials and affliction because the dragon is madder than ever. By God allowing the dragon into the earth at this point is not just punishing the devil, but is preparing the saints for forming the Lamb's nature within them. Pouring these things out now, now has come, begins the government, the kingdom of it, to come by being worked in and out of us it actually begins the establishment of God's reign in us by lamb. The devil is cast down to the earth. Now comes salvation, strength, and, and 
the kingdom, the power of Christ, with the dragon in the earth, now the kingdom will be wrought in his saints. Now will be seen the true power of God's crucified Messiah. It is clear that this is the meaning by reading verse 10 and 11 combined together. And they overcame him, the one placed among us, by the shedding of innocent blood, a martyr testimony, and not loving their lives to avoid death. They overcame him. This is their victory, not their loss. According to verse 12, those who are upon the earth can live in one of two ways. They can live as from above where the lamb is sovereign, or they can live as mere inhabitants of the earth. <clears throat> I guess I should read that. Oh, no, gosh. Verse 11, 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Notice, ye heavens and those who dwell. Woe to the inhabitants or those who dwell in the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So <clears throat> it, is clear from, it is clear that this is the meaning by rendering, let's see, where did I leave off here? According to verse 12, those who are upon the earth can live in one of two ways. They can live as from above where the lamb is sovereign, or they can live as mere inhabitants on the earth. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. If you dwell above with your eyes firmly affixed upon the lamb, then rejoice. But if in the earth then the devil's presence will merely be woe. In verse 13, we see the dragon's next attack to be against that which brings forth the seed. It is the woman. Even as in the exodus from Egypt, in verse 14, though under attack, either dragon or Pharaoh, she is given wings to escape to the wilderness. We might even consider similarities in verse 15 where the serpent cast a flood out of his mouth to destroy her. Could this also be similar to the serpent's flood cast at Eve when he said to her, Yea, hath God said? In the case of the Red Sea, it was a, uh, it was a wall meant to drown Israel. The dragon in verse 17 gets angry with her, but cannot touch her, so he makes war against the seed of the woman. When we compare verse 11 with Revelation 16, 10 and 11, we see a contrast. Though both groups are in tribulation, pain and death, one group allows these things to form the lamb in them, and the other group curses God because they feel pain and hurt. That's it. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for your graciousness to speak to our hearts, not about religious things or trying to make us more religious, look, act, talk, more, more religious, not more of Christianity, Father, but more of Christ. He must increase, not Christianity. Father, it never said Christianity must increase. It said he must increase, and we even John the Baptist, a man of God, a man that stood for you, a man that died for you, said, I must decrease even in all of my goodness and all of my works and all the things I've done for God. I must decrease because it's a he that needs to increase. So, Father, just help us to grasp, 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 not just the words, but the heart that spoke the words and the spirit behind it, the Holy Spirit that breathes the reality of Christ, the unveiling, the revelation of him, and help us to be drawn, help our hearts to be laid bare and, and drawn, and may we be drawn to that altar, and may we not be afraid, but realizing that a sweet incense, a sweet savor of Christ will rise from us, and he will increase even as we decrease on that altar. Father, help us to understand not that in scary terms of book of Revelation or in losing and doing without and all this kind of stuff that we think in terms of, but to see it as it is in your heart. And we will, we will be unafraid. We will be drawn and we will not run. If you are truly lifted up, from this earth as, as in the cross, 
men will be drawn. Lord, help us here in this place to be faithful, not just to preach the cross, not just to preach Christ, but, the, but Christ in him crucified, the Lamb of God, slaughtered for your sake and for men's sake. Help us, Father, to comprehend that by your heart and not by my teaching or my mouth or my words. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.